Welcome to Hard Talk, I'm Stephen Sacker. Every day, the havoc wrought by the coronavirus pandemic worsens on public health and on the global economy. Economic activity beyond the barest of essentials has been frozen across much of the world. What on earth will the economic landscape look like when this is over? Well, my guest is Ulla Shalenius, the CEO of one of Europe's biggest vehicle manufacturers, Daimler. What will it take to survive the greatest economic shock in most of our lifetime? Ulla Schellenius in Stuttgart, welcome to Hard Talk. And let me begin with a simple question. What impact is this terrible coronavirus crisis having on your business? Stephen, thank you for inviting me to Hard Talk. This is uh, a most unusual and very challenging situation for our industry. Uh, we have at Daimler focused on two main priorities as we're tackling this challenge. First and foremost is the health and safety of our employees around the world, uh, taking measures uh, in accordance uh, with the authorities, starting in China a couple of months ago, but now also in Europe and in the United States, taking measures to protect our staff and also help uh, uh, authorities and societies to flatten this curve of this pandemic. And of course, second, it's the health of the company. So taking measures to protect our cash, managing our cash uh, throughout this uh, uh, most unusual of times. Let's, let's start with the human element. I think I'm right in saying that you have roughly 200,000 workers across the world. How many of those people are currently working? Uh, Stephen, it's even more than that. We're actually 300,000. And uh, it's different from country to country. Uh, in February, we stopped our production operations in China for a couple of more weeks uh, to then start gradually ramping up again. Uh, we have just announced uh, this uh, past week that we are stopping production in most of our European operations and also some of our North American operations. So tens of thousands of people uh, at the moment are home but also a large part of the company is still working. Are you paying those members of staff who are not working? This is an issue across the world now of what happens to workers who are laid off as a result of this pandemic. What are you doing? There are different regulations with regard to this around the world. Uh, here in Germany, there is a model that has worked quite well for the economy here. It's a law called short working, where you can send people home uh, for reasons of uh, lack of demand or, or things like this uh, very unusual situation. And the government pays for part of the cost of uh, the wages and uh, we pay for the rest. You are one of Europe's, one of the world's most famous and lauded historical manufacturing companies. Now, companies like yours are being asked by governments around the world to do some pretty extraordinary things. For example, to give over some of your engineering and assembly capacity to shift from making, in your case, cars, to making ventilators. Are you prepared to do that? We're taking a range of actions to help. Uh, this is one of the situations where everybody needs to come together and see what we can do to tackle this crisis. And yes, we're helping on many fronts. Of course, we're donating money. We have donated 110,000 of the masks that we would normally use in our paint shops and in other parts of the operations. Even to what you're mentioning, we have had the first requests for making uh, individual components. And we have uh, quite a capable 3D printing operation and some prototype parts are being made as we speak. So. Uh, uh, if and where we can help, we're very happy to do so. 
Let's talk about the financial state your company is in. We all know that the car industry has been under very heavy economic pressure long before the coronavirus struck. And I believe I'm right in saying that in the last quarter, Daimler actually made a loss, something almost unprecedented in your company. You are in a very weak position, are you not, to, to withstand the new pressures that come with this crisis? The auto industry as a whole is in transformation, a fundamental transformation, where you could almost argue that we are at the point in time where we have to reinvent the original invention uh, that was uh, from uh, the founding fathers of Daimler. Uh, we're talking about moving uh, towards CO2-free mobility. Uh, the digital revolution changes our products and also the way we work. So yes, uh, you could argue we're turning the company upside down. With regard to our financial results, uh, we have taken measures to strengthen uh, our balance sheet and our profitability. Let us be honest. Are you now in a battle for survival at Daimler? At this stage, we're not in a battle uh, for survival. Uh, we have a strong uh, gross liquidity position. And of course, uh, now we're adjusting our production capacities uh, to meet a period of lower demand, which is caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're very carefully managing cash. At the same time, uh, it's uncertain how long this crisis will go on. And of course, uh, at some point, uh, the industry as a whole, as well as our company, uh, we have to try to get back up again to normal operations and uh, generate more revenue. Yeah, I, I understand your wish and your desire, but let's look at reality. Investors are losing confidence in your future, it seems. I note that your share price, before recovering you know, a little bit in the last couple of days, your share price has sunk over 40% since this coronavirus crisis really hit home. Investors are losing confidence. The whole sector uh, and other industries as well have been hit very hard uh, in this very volatile and uncertain financial market. So we have had some uh, uh, big swings in the last couple of days. As you mentioned, it went back up again, uh, uh, unusually high. Uh, I think that is a reflection of the uncertainty. How long is the pandemic going to go on? When can the economy pick back up again? Uh, so it's not something that is specific to Daimler. Uh, but in a situation like this, it's our task uh, to manage our business, manage the cash, and make sure that we navigate through this crisis in the best possible way. And that's what we're focusing on. Some fundamental weaknesses, it seems to me, have been exposed in your business model in the last couple of months, not least your massive and growing reliance on China and the Chinese market. You sell more cars by value to China than you do in Germany and the US combined. And that has really hurt you as the coronavirus effectively closed down much of the Chinese economy from the beginning of this year. Can you learn from that? Over the last five to 10 years, China has been an absolute success story for us. And yes, we have grown significantly, significantly to the point where China now by a wide margin is our biggest market. Uh, as the corona outbreak started uh, and measures were taken in China, of course, uh, we ramped down production and demand fell away. But it's also the first country where we can now see a gradual return uh, to some sort of normalcy. Uh, in our production, in our operations in China, uh, we're almost back up to normal production and showroom traffic is starting to pick back up. So it could even be an opportunity uh, as Europe and the United States now some couple of months later hit this crisis uh, that we can uh, uh, gain revenues in China. So in general, uh, the reliance of China uh, is also an opportunity not just through a situation like this, but also for the future. Well, to be honest, that sounds like you're not learning any lessons at all from what has happened to you over the last three months. Do you really want to go forward with China being so utterly central to your entire business plan? I know it's the biggest 
consumer market in the world for you, but you're, surely you've learned something about the fragility of your model. China is uh, the biggest automotive market in the world, uh, uh, by a large distance to number two, which is the United States. If you are a global player, and in our case, the leading premium and luxury player in the world, not to focus on China as a growth market, I think would be a strategic mistake. So, of course, uh, this black swan, uh, the COVID-19 crisis has exposed global supply chains being dependent on each other. In this situation, uh, our procurement and supply team has actually mastered this very well uh, to make sure that where we could keep operations going, uh, we could also have the supply secured. Uh, to turn away from China at this point, which we also feel in the next 10 years uh, provides the biggest opportunity for growth, uh, I believe would be a mistake. Uh, uh, we are going to increase our activities in China and try to grow there. That doesn't mean that other markets are not uh, important for us. Of course, Europe and the United States and other places around the world, we will also seek growth. Uh, but we're not ruling out one region uh, as a, a strategic priority just because it happens to be a, a big and leading market. Mr. Shalanius, let me ask you about Germany. Here's a quote from your chancellor, Angela Merkel. She said, since German unification, then she corrected herself and said, no, since even the Second World War, there has been no challenge to our nation that has demanded such a degree of common and united action. When you look at Germany right now, do you believe you are seeing a response from the government which meets the scale of the challenge? The response for the German government has been comprehensive and, in my view, a, a good and measured response. What we need is a combination of solidarity and flexibility. Uh, solidarity in terms of taking all the measures that need to be taken to flatten this curve, everything from social distancing uh, to making sure that we have uh, all the equipment and everything that is needed to tackle this medical crisis, but also flexibility in the, in the economy and for the companies. Yes, we're ramping down production now, uh, but we also need to be ready uh, when we come out on the other side to go back up again. And especially, as I mentioned before, uh, the law of short working, that you can quickly take out capacity without having to lay off people, to then be able to turn that back on again, is, I think, something that uh, is uh, perhaps even unique for Germany uh, and is a good tool that the government has given industry in this situation. Uh, so the country is pulling together and uh, we are in a constant dialogue uh, how to manage this very delicate crisis. We are used to Germany being literally the, the engine, the motor of economic growth in Europe, economic stability. That looks as though it's going to be challenged. To quote Clemens Fürst, the president of the IFO Institute, who've just released latest figures suggesting a collapse in economic activity in Germany over the last month, quote, the German economy is speeding into recession. There are leading economists who think the country's GDP for this year could contract by up to 9%. As one of Germany's signature companies, businesses, you must accept that this is an environment in which your company is not going to be immune, is facing a profound crisis. There is no doubt uh, that this challenge is twofold, uh, both a medical one and an economical one. Uh, that is why we took such quick action with regard to matching uh, our production capacities with the supply, with the uh, demand situation that we're now seeing in the market, really managing cash. And uh, I think it's absolutely crucial as these things unravel that we uh, watch when can we turn back on again? How can that be done in a responsible way? Uh, that is being discussed now, but I think it is maybe a bit too early uh, to make a final prediction of where this is going to go, uh, uh, but at the same time being very realistic that, yes, of course, this will have an economical and financial impact on everybody.
Well, let, let, let us compare and contrast Europe and the United States across Europe uh, from your own situation in Germany where the regions and the government are in essence operating a form of lockdown, not entire, but a lockdown, to Italy and France and Spain where the lockdown is complete. We see in Europe a, a, a very dramatic and indefinite freeze of economic activity. But then we contrast that with Donald Trump's message to the American people where he says, I want America to be back open for business, people back to work, he says, by Easter, which is mid-April. Now, which approach do you believe is the right approach? In the European situation, I think the situation is being managed day by day. So at this point, we don't know when you can responsibly uh, start uh, picking up activity again. Uh, so there's not an exact time frame on that. We can see that in the United States, many cities and many regions are acting uh, in a similar way than Europe, but also keeping economic activity down the road uh, in the back of our minds. So what we will have to do over the next few weeks is really to calibrate this. How can the uh, uh, COVID-19 curve be flattened uh, so that the health systems can cope with it and then be able to step by step turn the economy back on again? Yeah. So being, in terms uh, of what will actually Shalinis, happen you're, you're, in the next three to four weeks. So, yeah, sorry, Mr. Shalinis, you're being very measured. You're, you're giving me a, a, a very dispassionate answer. But ultimately, this is about it's about an emotional as well as a logical reaction. Donald Trump says there is a danger that the cure, i.e. total lockdown, is worse than the disease. And he sort of implies that in the end, societies have to sacrifice a little bit, maybe the lives of some of the older and more vulnerable people in society to ensure that the economy can keep going, that masses, millions of people have work to do, that they do not go hungry and that society continues to function. Where do you as a business leader sit on that argument? Do you feel any sympathy with Donald Trump? Uh, for us, as I said, two priorities, health and safety of our employees, but also the health of the company. That is why we're also going through a balancing act. We have not turned off the company completely. We have stopped many of our production operations and we have stopped also some of our administrative operations. But most of our R&D is still going. We're of course taking measures. We're dividing development teams into two groups. Even the board of the company has been divided into two groups. So as we're navigating through this crisis, we're trying to do both. It is a balancing act, and I don't think it's a situation where it's either or. And I believe everybody realizes, uh, including the politicians in Europe, that the economy is important and that in a responsible way, we're looking for a scenario how to get back up again and get into operations, as we can see happening in China at the moment. You told me earlier that right now you don't feel this is a battle for Daimler's survival, but it could become so. We don't know how long Europe and the United States are going to be in the midst of this crisis. We don't know how deep the recession stroke economic depression that comes as a result of this economic shock is going to be. But there are clearly people in Germany who are extremely worried. There are ministers in your government who are saying we may lose some of our greatest and best businesses and we will, if necessary, intervene to do whatever it takes to ensure they are not sold off cheap to foreign interests. We are, and I'm quoting now the Justice Minister, Christine Lambrecht, speaking just recently, we are prepared to take national stakes in these businesses, partial or full stakes, if necessary. Could that happen to you? Well, the first, first thing that needs to happen, and action has been taken here, is when you lose the revenue side for a period, uh, for some companies, and this is very important for our supply base down to the tier two, three, and four, is to provide liquidity and credit. This is happening in an unbureaucratic way so that uh, companies have access to liquidity. That is the first uh, port of call uh, in this uh, uh, management of the crisis. 
in our own case, uh, being a company with a healthy uh, gross liquidity, of course, we are managing our cash. So we are now uh, adapting our production to meet demand and looking at every single expenditure in the company uh, to make sure that we can uh, weather this storm. It's too early now to say how long it will be. Can something like that go on indefinitely? No, it can't. Uh, but as we sit here today, I don't want to speculate uh, about what the world looks like in six months from now, but rather focus on the next week's months uh, to manage this as best we can Understood. and be in an open dialogue with government on how we can turn the economy back on again. But put it this way, is it conceivable to you that if the crisis goes in the worst way, worst case scenario, is it conceivable to you that Daimler could be nationalized? It's not the scenario that we're discussing at this stage. Uh, and I don't want to do hypothetical speculation here. Uh, what we're doing is protecting our liquidity and our cash position uh, to make sure that we best possible navigate through this uh, very challenging crisis. Just a quick thought before we end about lessons to learn. Some people are saying the disastrous consequence of this is that companies like yours, which are trying to spend a huge amount of your R&D on electrification, creating a new uh, sort of wave of electric cars, you're not going to do that. You're going to have to withdraw a lot of that investment. And actually, you're going to lose out in the long run because innovation and electrification will have to take a back seat. We're on a journey uh, towards CO2 neutral mobility, and we have uh, set as an ambition for our company to across the board uh, over the next couple of decades to go CO2 neutral. That is a strategic decision that won't change. Uh, all our R&D projects as we sit here today uh, are alive and on track. Of course, we will monitor the situation and how deep this crisis becomes and manage our cash accordingly but it does not change the strategic direction. Uh, and we're doing everything we can to protect this seed for the future, if you will, uh, as we're managing through this crisis. And a final thought, you're one of the most global com companies one could imagine. Your supply chains, your markets, they're all over the world. They rely on an open, interconnected world. Globalization is under real threat. It may never be the same again after this coronavirus pandemic. That is perhaps your biggest problem of all. Uh, globalization for the past decades uh, for the world, but also for companies or industries, companies like ours, industries like the auto industry, has been a big benefit. It's created growth, it's created jobs, and it's created also uh, financial strength so we can invest into these future technologies that we're talking about. So we are a very strong proponent of keeping the system of global and open trade alive. Now, the COVID-19 crisis has been an absolute stress test for these global supply chains and has been an, I would say, unwelcome opportunity for us to see how they work. I've been absolutely amazed uh, at how well uh, across countries, from China to Europe to United States and many other countries, we have been able to manage these supply chains. That doesn't mean that we're going to naively sit back uh, and not have some lessons learned from this crisis. Uh, we will look at uh, where we need to make, make uh, supply chains more robust. Uh, but I want to underline, uh, we are a company uh, that fully supports and think it's best for everybody if we keep uh, the globalist idea alive. And who knows, maybe we can save a few business trips now that we know uh, that digital, digital tools, video conferencing and other tools work well for many meetings as well. Ulla Shalenius, this particular <laughs> digital connection has to end right there. But thank you very much for joining me on Hard Talk from Stuttgart.